we'll start right away with communications island. Uh, items. Matt? Mary, you're up. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to everyone else as well. All right, let's start with kudos to our students, staff, and family for following the COVID protocol, which allows us to offer in-person learning five days a week. It's so exciting to have all the kids back. The hum is just amazing. And we'd also like to do kudos to our students, staff, and family for continuing to partner with us to provide a positive remote learning experience. We do have 21 kids that are currently in remote learning. Two of those 21 are in quarantine. So that's a pretty good, pretty good um, return to being in person ratio. Um, we've got a couple hurdle, hurdles that we don't see as barriers, but things that we can work through, those being the lunch lines with social distancing, um, recess that we're still separating by classroom so as to not cross mingle our kiddos, and then screen time with our friends that are still learning from home. Um, our food drive is well underway. We've divided the building into two, so kindergarten through second grade and third through fifth. So we have a peanut butter side and a jelly team, and they're playing against each other to bring different things in, and we have dress-up days all week. It's, it's an exciting time. Just brings us back to last year at this time when um, we were doing the food drive and then everyone got sent home and how invaluable all of the supplies that we had gathered at that point were to our local food shelf. So it kind of keeps us going these days. Kindergarten Roundup is well underway. We will be sending letters with preschool students and um, via mail to those that are eligible for kindergarten but aren't in our preschool program. That should come out the last week of March. The health office staff will call our families April 19th and 20th to get ready for Roundup on April 22nd and 23rd. So because of COVID, we're gonna have small group, group sessions and we will ask families to only bring one parent <coughs> per child instead of the traditional two and a couple of siblings. So we'll keep things as small as we possibly can. There won't be a bus tour this year, of course, but the transportation director, Michael, will be there to work with parents and an answer any questions that they have. Of course, at this time, we're also preparing for the 2021-2022 school year. So we're talking about class sizes, we're talking about staffing, budgets, we're gonna have a strong literacy focus K through eight next year. Um, and that involves some, the new 2020 commissioner approved ELA standards. It involves professional development in a possible literacy boot camp. provides <clears throat> ongoing PD for our teachers. Um, we've got a couple of really, really um, integral research-based intervention and teaching programs that we'd like to train our staff on. Um, we'll talk about instruction. We'll be looking at data to better inform our instruction using our universal screeners and some specific intervention. And then we're gonna schedule, schedule some literacy blocks next year. Or, you know, if, if our belief is that children learn best when they're young in that pre-K through third grade, then we've gotta put our money where our mouth is and put all of our resources in those areas to better improve what our kids do from third grade and beyond. So I'm really excited. It's, it's going to be a lot of work. We're gonna to have to put our, you know, best feet forward and stay kid focused, but I think we can do it. Any questions or concerns? Go ahead. I was just going to ask, what is the um, kindergarten roundup numbers looking? What are they looking like? Seventy-nine. We do know that out of that number, we have a few that have chosen to keep their children an extra year. You know, some of those younger kiddos that have summer birthdays, and we do also know that there are a possibility of one or two retentions in kindergarten. Um, family recommended, of course. So, neutral. My only question was on planning, maybe a little more. So we're here. Yes. We're listening to the CDC letting up on some of the rules. Are you finding yourself still in like a multiple plan that if some of this kind of stuff still exists and social distancing exists and one if it doesn't? So, or how are you handling that? Yeah. The only or just moving on the go. The only thing that we've changed at this point is because we're five days a week at the elementary, we can do three foot of social distancing. Mm -hmm. So in the hallway when the kids line up for lunch. They're three feet instead of six. We haven't changed where they sit in the cafeteria, how they've changed. We haven't changed any of the classroom scenarios. We're still under the belief that we'll do as close to six feet as we possibly can. We still follow masking mandates. We still ask the kids to pull them up if they're slipping. We've got all the sanitary stations for hand washing. We do mask breaks. Really, the only thing we've changed is that three foot. Well, My question mostly was, for next September. Oh, yeah, we'll have to see what they yeah, expect yeah. us to do. Yeah. Like last year, Matt, I think you guys, you and the whole administration staff, you had to have like three plans because nobody knew where we were, but we still had to be ready. Is that, are you finding yourself still there? Yeah, that's a good question, Bruce. And um, 
you know, I, I think right now the conversation is moving forward with what we know is in place now. Um, but you're absolutely right. You can't hardly go a day or for sure a week without some new announcement or new modification or next phase or all of that. Um, so I guess what I'm really interested to see what is going to come specifically from the Minnesota Department of Health in conjunction with the Minnesota Department of Education come May is is really what what I'm curious about. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just a lot of extra work when you got to have multiple plans for next September and you don't know where you're going. It's something that we had last year. You would hope someday that will go away and we can be on one method. And there's a lot of traction with that conversation. Exactly the question you're asking there, that question is is becoming louder and louder and louder. Okay. There's, there's a lot of conversation around, can we get some clear direction so that everybody's working on from, from the same perspective? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hopeful that there's gonna be some answers. I'll be honest right now, there, there's not right now. <laughs> It's where we're at today, and and we'll see what happens come come June. Yep. Do we have a lot of elementary students that opted to stay distance? That'll be the 19. Yes, so 19 families, and there's a good mix there between health reasons and you know whatever other reasons that the family has. How how does a teacher manage that when she's got most of her students in the classroom and only a few out? Um, lots of our teachers at the elementary level, at least, um, are utilizing Google Classroom and Google Suites, and so they're creating lessons that allow them to either record themselves or be visible with synchronous learning, and so their children in the classroom are doing the same thing that the children online are doing. It's, it's kind of enticing to see the whole process unfold. Sometimes you don't know that there's a student present on the laptop until you hear that voice on the speaker system, you know, and then you, oh, that's right, we have a remote learner with us at this time. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort, but they're doing it. They're working really hard. We learned a lot from last spring. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Mary. Thank you. David? All right. Hello. Um, yeah. I I would like to kind of echo what Mary said about um, just being really proud of the way things are going so far. Um, this is our first week with uh, back in person and it's been going really well. Um, it's we're trying to be consistent with everything and we're trying to just kind of feel things out to make sure that, um, you know, lunch is going smoothly and we've done some staggering of releasing classes and things like that. What helps is uh, uh, when the weather is nice, we have a lot of kids that eat out in the courtyard and and they eat quickly and they're off doing other things. So that's been helpful for us. Um, we are in the middle of registration for next school year. We've pretty much got most of our uh, next year's juniors and seniors registered. We're trying to, um, the, the students that are here, we're bringing them in in small groups and walking them through the process of putting it into Infinite Campus. And then we are, we're holding virtual meetings uh, with our students that are remote and, and kind of working through that process so that we can get each grade level um, finished before we, as much finished as we can before we move on to the next grade level. So tomorrow we will be um, registering our current freshmen uh, next year, sophomores, and we should be able to get most of those finished tomorrow. And then we'll um, work our way through and hopefully by the end of the day on Friday, we'll have most of our students registered. Uh, we're going over to uh, the elementary tomorrow afternoon to meet with the current fifth graders and walk through that process a little bit. Um, so some of the upcoming uh, events, uh, prom and post prom, we are just, things are up in the air. And there's a, a group of area principals who uh, are, are talking quite often and, and just kind of bouncing ideas off each other and seeing where we're at. And, and um, so we're planning on May 15th. What exactly that's gonna look like is, is 
Um, there's some plans in the works, but we are just waiting to see if some of that guidance is going to change. I did meet with um, with Kari and Dom yesterday, and we just kind of walked through the significant event um, guidelines, and and um, we'll just continue to wait for guidance on that. Graduation, also, um, you know, we. I think what we learned last year is that there are ways to have graduation that that are different than the traditional and and people seem to like some of the things that we incorporated last year. So I think we're going to be looking at a combination of of some of those things. And, and again, the guidelines are going to kind of drive that. But at this point, we are looking at an outdoor graduation service um, and uh, and we, we would have a contingency plan in case there's inclement weather. Um, targeted services, uh, we are, an invite went out to uh, families of all of our middle school students today, and we're looking to start a, an after school program that would begin um, the last week of March and run three weeks in April. And it would be two days a week for all of our, we, we're gonna invite all of our middle school students and it'll be a part um, academic enrichment, part physical activity of some sort, and um, also some projects in the innovation center. So we're hoping to get, we do have a minimum number that we need, and so we're hoping to get um, some of those students signed up. So um, that is about all I have. Anything, any questions about anything? Okay, it's David. Well, we have our winter sports winding down where um, dance has already competed in sections, wrestling section started, and our girls and boys basketball have their last week of uh, regular season. Uh, gymnastics has their section event coming up as well, I believe on the 19th. Um, so we're, uh, I guess so far, um, we've made it, we've had at least two teams and officials at every contest, and I joke around about that, but that was a real serious concern when we were rebuilding those schedules and doing all that um, so far so good so um, spring sports guidance came out from the Minnesota State High School League yesterday so today we met as a conference and we did schedule that meeting because we were anticipating that guidance to come out yesterday and so we um, completely rebuilt our track schedules uh, that's probably the spring sport as well as golf um, that takes the biggest hit with the new guidance we're only allowed up to uh, five teams or four teams based on how many participants are involved and so forth. And so um, we have 14 meets that we're allowed to have and we're going to, as a conference, we've chosen to do seven um, dates, basically the regular season on all Tuesdays, uh, two different sites and the conference are going to host half of the schools and then Thursdays we're going to try to find alternate um, contests or meets with the other schools. Um, so working on that and we will um, hopefully have all the schedules for spring sports done. Um, the goal is by the end of this week, uh, of course, we're working with other people and they have to respond to that too. So um, we'll continue to do the Bulldog schedule with the spring sports like we did with the winter sports and link any live streams. I don't know how much live streaming action there will be with the outdoor uh, events, but we will continue to do that when possible. And, uh, I, and I know people were using that in the in the winter and we had a lot of changes on you know specifically lately we've had a lot just with hockey there's been a lot of jv games canceled and so forth and it's just i feel like another resource where somebody can go to and they can just see exactly what's going on um, as a one-stop shop march 29th is the beginning of spring sports for most programs baseball on march 22nd starts with uh, arm they have an arm care they can't officially do any practice type drills but they can uh, condition their arms and then uh new to us this year because junior high football was moved to the spring last year uh we're not going to do that until uh weather permitting but we for sure won't until after the spring break and so april 7th is the plan um to start that uh, we do have uh, had softball coach in place, which will be coming to the board uh, at your next business meeting. Zach Nelson um, is excited to start and um, coach, and so we're excited to have 
uh, that um, for our softball girls. We've been kind of busy planning and organizing moving forward, not only with the new facility, but also with uh, gymnastics transitioning back onto site. Um, some different needs that we're going to have from a storage standpoint. So we've been meeting with FIED and with Community Ed and with all of the um, activity departments and how can we best utilize the storage that we're going to need. Of course, with gymnastics coming that kind of eliminates the ability to have access to some of that middle school gym storage where different things have been stored. Um, if you go out into the cafeteria, you'll notice that we had where that old display case was. There is now a doorway in there and there will be a roll up door uh, for access and that's been kind of converted into storage and that will be the plan to utilize uh, that going forward. Um, it's been fun working with our community ed director and talking about how we can best utilize the new facilities uh, for all of our programs, not only for our activities department, but as well as the community and our um, in-school curriculum is, is an exciting time for, for our community, everybody, our whole school system. So I don't know if anybody has any questions for me. I just have, for the Spring Sports Center, with everything you push back, is that going into the summer very far, or how is that going to work? Um, yeah, I should have wrote it down. I, I think the primary end date is like a June 19th, if that's a Saturday in there, and that's going to be the end culminating time for most of those state tournaments. And the interesting thing is they kept the same number of contests. And I think the reason was is spring sports, if you remember, got hit hard by the pandemic last time. And so they didn't want them to take a hit through all of the rescheduling. Well, they moved the start date back for the seasons, but for like baseball and softball, we really realistically weren't going to play until April 8th is the first day you can play anyways. And that's the first start. So we actually have three more basically weeks in the regular season that have now been added, but the same number of games. So we end up with a schedule that now we have a three week window at the end before playoffs start. So we have to move all that. And it'll be really interesting because the whole dynamic of kids no longer being in school, but having activities um, coming here and some regular season activities still going on. We're generally have been done, but yeah, it's about June 19th will be the end of it. Has there been any more input on um, our young athletes and masks? Has anything changed? No. No, the, uh, the high school league has not um, gotten any guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health of what spring sports or outside sports will look like. Currently, the only thing they have listed on their guidance is a link to their face coverings guidance right now, which only has exemptions for some of the current sports. Okay. So as it sits right now, uh, baseball, softball, golf, track athletes at Painsville, if nothing changes, would have to put masks on. Even outdoors. That's as it sits as right it sits now. now. Yeah. Okay. Unless they make changes. That's, I mean, it's right in their guidance that they gave and they link that document and the only sports um, that we currently offer that have an exemption are uh, wrestling and gymnastics. Okay. So there's swim and dive, obviously, for obvious reasons, but other things. So um, we're hopeful, but. So far, no change. <laughs> okay. And I don't know if you've heard any. I've just heard more questions and conversation about it, but I've not heard any real traction <clears throat> that that it's going to change. Um, there was the lawsuit, obviously, and that was dismissed, I think, relatively quickly as well. So okay. right now it's the same. And there is talk, <laughs> only speculation, that they may increase the indoor capacity for some of the state tournaments, basketball and <clears throat> hockey is, are the ones I've seen referenced. And so... If they're relaxing some of those restrictions, that might be a good sign for masks for outdoor activities. But so, any other questions? Thank you, Max. Yep. Thank you. Hey, Matt. Hey. All right. Good evening. Ooh. We'll pass out some stuff here. All right. Uh, kind of some reports with the district back to full in-person learning. Um, we're able to do a few more community ed activities, which is good. So we're starting to ramp up some of that. Um, our pause report, um, March 15th, summer pause and preschool will be opening up at 8 a.m. Pause registration in preschool. 
the fitness center is starting to get a little uptick in in usage and membership, which is good now. Um, we're just kind of getting used to the to the requirements. Uh, live stream report: Our last regular season winter broadcast is this Friday uh, for the Bulldog Boys basketball as they take on Melrose. Um, our spring broadcast season is all set, um, uh, almost full with for sponsorships. We just have a couple spots left. And uh, one kind of neat thing is we're we're planning to do three softball home games and three baseball uh, with our full production. And I just installed this last week a um, outdoor PTZ permanent camera at the baseball stadium that we use uh, revenue from our sponsorships um, that can act like our huddle cam. So we can offer we can broadcast any games out on the baseball field. Still has to be tested to make sure it works how we want it, but it goes directly to YouTube, just like Max's Huddle Cam does. And we can actually hook in. We can't do our full production through that one, but we can hook in um, if somebody wanted to do commentary. We can hook into that camera, so kind of opens up that we can do some uh, younger kids games. We could do Babe Ruth in the summer. I'd like to get some kids even um, learning to call games on there, and then we can just uh, set it to go and run those games without having to line up our whole production staff. So our first one, we're gonna be testing that out is April 22nd. We're gonna be doing the full production of the softball game, but there's a baseball doubleheader that night. So we're gonna run that camera uh, for those two games at the same time. So kind of exciting. So um, I sent out a new Bulldog Bart today. So uh, if you know of other community people that wanna be on that database, um, it gets a lot of opens and a lot of forwards, so which is good because we can kind of track that. So uh, if you have any recommendations or people that you want added, just let me know. Uh, new community, community center planning, the PAC. So that's an example of something that we're working on next year for a big winter fest. Um, kind of got everything all in place. So those are the kind of things that we'll be um, having the events in there probably by each season and then also lots of tournaments and we already have the youth wrestling as booked some things. We have volleyball that's doing. So it's gonna be a hub of activity. And then right now I'm working on uh, hours of operation, membership structure, uh, regular offerings and schedules. I'm doing a new website for there. So it's really exciting time for what's possible. I mean, we're in a district that we just haven't had gym space or indoor activity space available consistently for our community. It, it just, that's the reality when you get our, our, our local sports and our activities, it's just, we're so spread out. So this is gonna open up a lot of opportunities. So um, lots of different party opportunities, birthday parties and events. And so it's exciting, exciting planning for the pack. So uh, any questions? Has there been any inquiry from outside groups as far as uh, rental of the pack and everything yet? I mean, has that been something that's, or is it still kind of wishy washy, not knowing what, you know, what the future will hold? Yeah, is? so actually, I've had conversations, meetings with Paysetter, um, and then other outside groups would be like technically outside groups are like the Youth Wrestling Club. Yep. So those are the main ones so far. Um, Jeff would like to do a lot here. And, and like in our conversation, we talked about course first priority or school and then you know our local teams want to offer things but it's going to be a real win-win opportunity for for them and for us here so and we had talked about at admin about you know looking at uh you'll be seeing assuming come probably coming to the board on you know maybe some changes to the rental policy you know just to make because it it's a lot different than having just a high school gym or middle school gym now we have multiple courts so and the facility so i've looked at other community centers and uh we're kind of we'll probably have a recommendation on on some updates to that too just to i guess promote and just to make it work where it's um appealing i guess for both us and for other outside groups so other questions as i asked about the um, technology at the baseball field is the hope that <clears throat> that really works obviously well that we would want that for every space that we have so when gymnastics is up and running we would have you know that technology available yeah so that, that would, all sports could be that'd be fantastic yeah. wouldn't it yeah i'm really excited for gymnastics because you know we did all their meets this year and the uh, assembly grounds was great cronus ministries actually 
you know, ran, they had in their, their strategic plan to get internet out there, but they actually did it ahead of schedule and it really worked out well. But I can't wait till I don't have to go set up and carry all the stuff out there. Um, so right now with our current infrastructure, Jonah Johnson has done just amazing. Like we have a great highway and what we've invested with these PTZ cameras and everything, we can, in the middle school gym, just plug our PTZ cameras in a network and actually produce from up in Crow's Nest in the high school gym. We'll actually be producing the softball games from the Crow's Nest is our plan. So we're going to be running, you know, a cable out, you know, just for our camera to a network. But absolutely for us to be, to have a facility in the softball, because um, right now we're fingers crossed that it's going to work because we're running right. cables 300, 400 feet. So, well, yeah. And there has been significant, I mean, part of what Matt's alluding to is there's been significant intentional efforts to get fiber run to specific locations to be able to get that infrastructure in place and to have that backbone. It doesn't yeah. really matter where you're at on our campus, that then we can um, use some of this plug and play technology that has come a long way right? and and be able to do some pretty dynamic productions with it. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because for baseball, for our full productions, we have that new camera I talked about mm -hmm. for like just not produce, but we actually have a uh, fiber strand that runs from the scoreboard, uh, from the press box to the scoreboard. And there were some extra, if you think of fiber, it's almost like hairs, but the actual <coughs> cables, some fiber lines that were available. So Jonah and I are working on getting that. So now we'll have a network drop actually at the uh, scoreboard. So our plan is to have a center field PTZ camera for our fully produced uh, baseball games. So we'd be able to zoom in and you'd be able to see the pitch happening and then zoom out. So that's kind of in our, in our, it, that's in the works right now. And hopefully we can get that all, all to work out. But absolutely like Matt said, that's because we have fiber now, fiber internet actually out to the baseball stadium and we have it out to the uh, football tower. And our plan would be to have and it at a softball it's, tower. It's buried in a pit now yeah. for when we go forward with the softball yeah. flip. Mm -hmm. If the fiber's in the pit, yeah. just waiting it's for ready where we want that that fiber to to go to and what building whether it's an actual press box whether it's that that auxiliary building yeah. um but but it's it's over there now and now it's just waiting for us to make the final link to whatever we have to connect it to yeah. i imagine it's nice for coaches too if they could record practices they can't see everything they're going to be able to yeah mm -hmm. watch things that's very cool any other questions Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And Donnie is unable to be here tonight, so we will catch him next next month. All right, item B, budget development. Matt, we'll go back to you. All right, let's go. Um, this document is in, in your drive folder too, if you do want to pull it up, you, you certainly may. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll take a, a look through this. Um, there's budgeting timeline, uh, those that have been through this, this, you have probably seen this timeline before, but just as a general rule of thumb, the, the process that we'll go through as we develop our 21-22 budget. Um, obviously last month, there was a discussion about the 21-22 budget at that business meeting is when that budget reduction number was set. Um, in March, you guys are gonna have a second uh, review of that budget. There will be more details as far as budget reductions and what that can look like at that point. Um, first, uh, potential uh, important date as far as if we do have to lay any uh, certified employees off, the first important date is April 1st. So that would be the date we'd have to notify continuing contract teachers. Um, third budget review um, would be in May. And uh, again, it, I think a lot of things will kind of come into focus by the time we get there. And then June 30th is really the, the important date for the board. That's the date that by statute, we have to have a preliminary budget in place for the upcoming 21-22 um, school year. The last date of importance, and it's uh, you know July 1 ultimately is the date, but the way statute is written, it says prior to July 1. So 
if we would have to uh, lay off any probationary teachers, um, that would be the date that we are required to, to notify them. So that's kind of the timeline we're following. Um, as I stated, you know, we're, we're looking at a $500,000 budget reduction target. So I just kind of want to talk through where things are at and, and what we, we think we potentially know um, at this point. Um, we have uh, March 1 is an important date and particularly our teacher contract. That is the date that uh, if teachers are eligible for the severance article that's in the teacher's master agreement, they have to notify us if they are planning to retire. That's the date in the contract. So obviously March 1 is come and gone. So we do know that we are gonna have some retirements and when we look at all uh, potential retirements throughout the district, we're looking at roughly uh, ballpark is about $490,000 in, in savings is, is what we are estimating will come in. Now, that number seems like, hey, this is gonna be pretty easy because if our target's only $500,000, that just means we're $10,000 away. Just know some of those retirements we are going to need to go back and fill, which doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see the full $490,000 savings from those um, those retirements. Shared services. Um, currently, we are sharing uh, business manager services with BBE schools. We are have talked with them. Um, from my perspective, Right now, I would see that we would be able to for sure commit to sharing, uh, expanding that uh, business management um, service in the payroll. I think it would make a lot of sense to have both districts, just have one person in, in the um, one of the two districts be responsible for payroll. Um, that most likely would be a current Painesville employee that would, would take on those responsibilities. Um, I see the 21-22 school year as being the transition period for us moving to shared payroll services with the actual implementation where it would be one payroll office between the two districts would be actually in the 22-23 school year is when it would start. But we would use 21-22 as a way to, to get uh, prepared for that. District assessment coordinator is a need for both districts. and. That is something where I do think we can um, move in that in that shared model. I think that's very, uh, very doable. Um, and then also uh, some network administration services. Uh, we have some available um, time with network administration and, and BBE is, is potentially interested in that. Um, the one that is on there that I know the board members that uh, were on the Zoom call with BBE when we talked about this, I know the, one of the other ones was buildings and grounds. Um, I think there's been a couple of issues uh, raised uh, in both districts. And so right now that uh, sharing of a buildings and grounds director is not part of, of what is on this, uh, this list at all. So when you look at shared services, when I calculate it out as a kind of a budget estimate, I would say that we could net about just shy of $40,000 in, in savings by moving to a shared model. Two shared services, would they be housed in one building or both buildings or what's the thought there? Well, I'm curious. yeah, so it's interesting. Um, when you look at like um, payroll, payroll right now is really a, a uh, electronic transaction. So there wouldn't necessarily be a need to have who's ever responsible for payroll in both districts to have to be physically located in both districts at some time to do that. The flip side to that is when you go and look at like a district assessment coordinator, there's probably gonna be times where that district assessment coordinator will need to be in both districts. So I think the, the answer is it's fluid. It is really position dependent but as much as we can possibly leverage technology, um, the, the interesting thing is, um, for instance, like our student management system at Painesville is Infinite Campus. BBE has recently switched to Infinite Campus as well. So there are a lot of, of our backbone systems that we're running the same system. The, the system right now that uh, we access for all of our um, employee self-service uh, hosting, 
it's the same company that BBE uses for all of theirs. So a lot of this lines up naturally, and I would say it's varied, but some positions, yes, there would be people that would need to actually go to BBE to do some things, but then there's also other positions where um, it's it can be done virtually and, and wouldn't necessarily need to, to mean you're traveling between the two districts. Thank you. Can we currently share services with BBE? So we currently share business manager services. Um, that, that's it. That is it. Yep. Can we share services with any other districts? Not right now. Okay. We have some joint programming that we're doing. Um, so we have some things in place, like for instance, the Cold Spring um, uh, piece out at Cold Spring Granite. That's uh, Eden Valley, Watkins, Recory, Kimball, and Painesville are the four districts that are in there. Um, you know, David's done some things with BBE and New London Spicer and Painesville as far as course offerings and stuff. But as far as actual services, uh, kind of the behind the scenes stuff that is the day to day operation of a district, that that's the only money. thing. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, existing savings. So we do have uh, a position that went unfilled this year that was in the preliminary budget this year. Uh, we had some turnover among staff when we filled that position that that needed to be filled. We did leave one unfilled um, and we are going to move forward without filling that. So there that's what existing savings is that just over 21,000. And then um, snapshot. I think there's some possibility in, in talking with Mr. Orlein. There might be some possibility in in modifying some instructional supply budgets to maybe save $5,000. So you add those up and you're you're sitting at about five hundred and fifty five thousand or, or so dollars um, in potential reductions. So there's some other things that we have to consider. Um, so high school registration, Mr. Elaine mentioned that that's going on. Obviously, high school registration is is going to guide our final um, FTE allotment in our secondary building. And that will will be um, concluded here in the next week or so as as that registration um, period is is taken care of. I don't anticipate um, a huge um, amount of of changes. There could be uh, a little bit of of change in what we need for FTEs um, at the secondary building, but just know we won't know that until registration is actually complete. Um, uh, so ABSIS program application. Now, this isn't actually a reduction in the nature that, you know, a lot of times when districts set out on this path to reduce um, expenditures, they're solely trying to look at how do we uh, eliminate expenditures. This is actually um, moving in a direction where we would apply for ABSIS programming approval from MDE, and it would actually generate additional revenue for us. Um, so ABSIS is really about providing early services in order to hopefully prevent special education referrals or the need for students to qualify for special education. Uh, we currently have finalized our application. The due date for those was March 5th. We did submit ours, I believe, on the 3rd of March. And if it would be approved, that would be um, about $235,000 in additional state aid that we would, would be able to be eligible to receive. So while it's not a reduction, it is a, a increase in revenue. So I would put it on the list and, and we will wait and see. Um, as far as the turnaround time from MDE, um, they don't specifically put a, a date out there exactly when they will get back to us on it. Um, but they do also know that we are intending to implement that application for the 21-22 school year. So I would be hopeful that um, in early May, we would, we would know um, our application is approved or not. No, Questions on a, either of those? That's just a one year. That's, no, once, you're, once you have an approved application, so it's a two year approval. So we'd be good for 21-22 and 22-23. And then every two years, uh, there is a, a plan update process that you would be able to go in and modify your plan and um, be able to continue to participate. So that, I would look at that as that would be a, a, um, a permanent long-term um, revenue stream. And is there uh, uh, restrictions on 
where the money can be spent. And how Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the real key to really boil it down and make it simple is the only thing we can spend money on is actually providing student specific services that are scientifically based, grounded in best practice, proven to prevent um, special education referrals and placements. Perfect. So it's, yes, it's very narrowly uh, defined, but yeah, if we would qualify for that revenue, it's not something that then we can go and decide we're gonna fund this with that money or something. It, it is very scripted. It is a um, shared program. So our application for the ADSYS program was over $643,000 is what we are applying for. It's a um, cost, so it's a 50-50 cost sharing. So we would generate an additional $240,000 in revenue. The reason that's not exactly 50% is because of how they calculate benefits and all that stuff. Um, but then we would also then be responsible for the other half um, of it. Um, essentially, the bottom line, when it shakes out, we would be generating the additional revenue. Where it comes. Any other questions regarding those two? I, oh. I go back. I had a question about you know when we look at the registration and looking at kind of full time employees after that. Are we concerned that with our current enrollment, then how that will change? How do we manage that? Is it a short-term solution or is it something that we feel like it's okay and it's a good long-term decision? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's a, it's a catch-22, Maggie, and you're, I mean, you're spot on. I mean, unfortunately, we do have to plan for the here and now, but if we do have an increase in enrollment, then we're gonna have to address that. And, and we may be looking in June to be posting some positions and doing some things differently. Um, but it's really hard to, plan or hope for that with with the data that you have now. So other things that would need additional um, potential resources, when we talked on that first slide, we can't credit all that attrition to this. Um, clearly, you know, you heard tonight from both Matt and from Max about the addition. We will have some additional uh, buildings and grounds needs once that is complete. So that needs to be um, calculated and figured out. We, I think we have a good handle on that and a, a potential plan. I mentioned the district assessment coordinator. That is something that we would um, need. It would be a cost sharing uh, in a shared service, but, but we would need to take care of that. And then I just listed on here the other personnel question um, because I think those, until all of those questions are answered with personnel, you, you need to, to put that, that on the list too. So we still have the same moving targets that we talked about in February. Clearly, Minnesota hasn't gotten their pre-K-12 education bill done. Um, I'm, who knows? <laughs> who knows what's going to happen there? Um, the the uh, feds recently approved, the Senate approved the, the um, American Rescue Plan, and so that's obviously going to have some impacts as well. All of them are still unknown to at least Minnesota schools. I don't know if some states are starting to roll out what that would mean locally. Minnesota has not gotten anything out to districts yet. We have the statewide decline in, in enrollment. Painesville has been Im impacted by that as well. And uh, then we have the whole question of enrollment on 2122 and, and what does that look like and where do we see movement with that as we, um, as we move forward. I think we have a good plan when you're talking about budgeting with 910 students and a 1% um, foundation aid increase. I think that's a solid place to start, but just know we still have all of these moving targets that potentially could impact future discussions. So next steps with this, obviously we have to continue the, going down the process. There's gonna be additional discussions. Board, just know that the March business meeting, um, this will be a continued topic and then you will see it again at the May business meeting. Um, and if there would be a reason as to why it would need to be on the April meeting, we certainly have that, that flexibility as well. So contingency plan, you know, let's say the legislature being what it is right now, um, what if they don't get an education funding bill passed? What, 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 what do we do then? I mean, obviously we'll have to put the pieces together in some way, shape or form, but how much is that gonna complicate us? Cause I don't foresee it happening on time personally, but. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I think uh, there are things in here that could put us in a really good position to be able to mitigate that. Um, but that is something that as 
the days tick by here of the session, I think, yeah, we're going to have to make some adjustments in our, in our discussions, in our conversations, and, and exactly how we want to, to move forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I have serious questions as to when, when things are going to um, fall into place. We kind of have that every year, though, I have to say. Yes, we do. <laughs> and I brought it up before. It's the last day, and you guys, as managers of these schools, it's ridiculous that they, <laughs> they don't make their end date like April 15th so you can manage. Nope, they got to hold it till last minute. And it's very hard for everybody to work with. So moving forward, budget questions by all means. Um, uh, send me emails, give me a phone call. I'm more than happy to, to uh, visit if there are any specific questions from board members. But no, this is the beginning of the process and you guys are going to have more conversation about this moving forward. Can we go to district advisory committee? All right. Um, and I do just want to remind everyone we do have to adjourn by 6 p.m. So um, regardless of where we're at, we will adjourn by 6 p.m. Um, so I did send out uh, district advisory committee. Now remember this, we talked about this a little bit back with the policy committee doing some work. Um, my real hope here is that we can get a solid district advisory committee together that would really have some plan tasks and some things that we would really tap into this advisory committee to really help provide input, insight, perspective um, for the board and for the district. So you can see just a, a sampling of, of at least ideas that, that I know for sure are things that, that can be on there. Um, the real question and, and what I'm looking for board members to give me some feedback on um, you know, I have listed what the membership potentially could look like. I think this membership got to, is it 21 or 22? 21. 21, yeah. 21 people. Um, you know, I'm not afraid of having that number go a little bit higher to say maybe 24, 25. I really don't know that it's valuable to go much beyond that. But um, I think this is really what I'm looking for for some input is what does the board want for membership? Um, I do believe it's important for us to have a representative from the city of Painesville in, involved in that. I think there's also value in having someone from the Painesville Community Foundation involved in that. But there could also be other um, important community organizations that we feel should have a, a, a seat at that as well. Um, so I guess I would open it up to, to board and if not a decision you're going to make tonight, but eventually the board just needs to help finalize this document so that then I can go and implement something. When I looked at it, it looked like a really good place to start. Okay. And the thing is, as long as we don't get in it where it's etched in stone, this committee is going to find out real quick if you're missing somebody. Yep. Maybe more than us trying to pull it out of the, the sky. I think it's nicely put together. It encompasses a lot of people. At the same time, you're, it's not totally concentrated in one area. I thought it was well put together, but not to make it totally rigid. If you had to have to add a few people here and there, I'd go for it because we're looking for some advice. Yep. Personally, I'd like to see somebody, maybe a chamber representative that represents the business community. Okay. Um, but you do have, um, well, I, yeah, I just don't see that represented. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I think we want a wide spectrum. On the other hand, I even think 21, if they all come, it's a lot. It depend on how you handle the meetings. Um, that, was, that was my kind of first thought, too. Like, wow, that's a lot of people, and how is that meeting handled? But then again, going on the assumption that everybody shows up every meeting as well. As, right. You know, the, uh, on the other hand, if kind of people aren't showing up, they shouldn't be on the committee. Correct. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't ask somebody to be on to represent something and they say, well, yeah, I'll be there when I can. Yeah. Either mm -hmm. they don't want to be there, then fill it with somebody else. Yeah. But we do have five, you have five community members, which could be chamber, it could be mm -hmm. yeah. hospital. To but I do like the idea of having it, if, if available, if somebody's willing and able to volunteer for that, you know, track that. But they need to realize it's important. Correct. Yep. This isn't just another meeting that we want the chamber at or whatever. Yep. So would this be a committee that like the kind of volunteer manager lead would be you or who is the person? Because that is a lot of people to kind of 
that have questions and feedback? What does the structure look like? Yep. So um, in the the admin team has kicked this around at one admin meeting, so it's bad conversation, but it's in its infancy. Um, the conversation that we had at admin team was that that I would facilitate this group. Now, when I say I would facilitate it, it truly would be a facilitative role because when you look at what some of these topics are going to be, these the these are things that we have people that are already doing it. very much involved in these, and I would be bringing them to the meeting mm -hmm. to to be part of the meeting and to be able to to help um, with that. But as far as who's going to stay on top of scheduling and making sure the meeting is is scheduled and that type of stuff, yes, that would be something that um, that I would be involved in. And my other kind of what I'm thinking is, I mean, these are some. A wide variety of topics like some of them used to live in one committee and so i think it needs to be really clear with the committee members that hopefully they're going to do a lot of homework mm -hmm. and that's expectation I mean, there's if you're going to show up in a meeting and talking about all these things that hopefully there's a lot of homework provided that people can come really prepared with questions um so what i don't want to see is like it becomes kind of like the world was, you know, where you just come to listen and check off right. that, that it truly is right. beneficial right. for both. Yep. Both, I guess. And the other part is like the school and culture or school culture and climate. I mean, yeah, I imagine you'll probably still have a committee in that and they'll come and present and okay. Yep. Other questions with this? Just curious, like a wide, wider scope of things are you finding a lot of school districts are moving towards like advisory committees as the admin team found anything like that is it becoming more common a way to streamline things maybe or i think it's all over the board Jake. Okay. I, I think there are districts that have a very active district advisory committee that is like this model mm -hmm. and then i think there are districts that have a world's best workforce committee and they just get together to meet the statutory requirements they have a, a committee that gets together to do the the curriculum or student achievement piece um, so it it truly is really all over the board um, i personally i see value in having the same group yes. do that work on a variety of different elements of the district um, versus trying to continue to facilitate and organize five different committees it, it just this to me simplifies a lot of this right it's, then you're not training all these different committees on the same thing if everybody understands what the standards are and everybody understands what our core requirements are it will hopefully flow better but it's a big thing about engaging the people of the community <laughs> and you have to do that in some of these things we talk about everybody, some people aren't gonna show up and some people are not, that's just gonna happen. But if you have enough people there, you can keep it rolling, but we have to do everything we can to engage other people than we're, we're seeing. I look in here, city's gonna be out of normal stuff for the school district. The community foundation is going to be out of normal. Three community members, five parents, yep, they're involved with their students. This is mostly people representing parts of our community. I, I just don't see how you can you can miss. Now, I'm sure if we went to a meeting, a person could sit through the meeting and wonder what you accomplished. It only has to be one or two items in a meeting can add up to be quite a bit of information. I, I think it's a really good idea. Is there a, a need for a board member to sit at the meeting as well? Yeah, the world of the workforce we already have uh, but I thought about that too. I went back to look at board committee assignments now. Did we actually do that? I know we talked about it at yes. that time. Yes. But Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So. And the school culture and climate also has someone in yeah. too or so. So yeah, some of that's already crossing over. And, yep. And again, probably less as a facilitator and more as a, a participant. And, right. And, uh, right. I think if you put the school board members on, it may not be quite as open. I happen to like it when we're not involved in some of this stuff and it comes to us. 
how many places have we sat and just been silent people listening? That is a whole different deal because we have so much other information about what's going on here. We, if we get at it, it's just like one more member of the school. We're looking for community input. I'm, I'm more wondering if, if there's any specific topics where we would have to be involved in due to Absolutely. receipt. So I agree. There could be certainly there could be a lot of meetings where we're not required to be there, and they probably shouldn't be there. But if there are meetings that yep. that we need to be there, yeah. And I don't mean to say this out of turn. But I sat on the world's best workforce for a lot of years. I personally think that's a lot of redundance over a whole bunch of information that gets to a point that we can't decipher it for real good usage in the first place, just required by the MDE that we get it there. And someday I'm going to make the call down there to see if they can dig out the report we sent in four years ago. So it didn't hit the ash can as soon as it got there. <laughs> I just. I'm missing something there. I, we have to do it. I'm just not sure. I like it when it's combined. Maybe we can make use of something that I don't see. Think about this um, for the next couple weeks here, and then let's finalize uh, what this is going to look like at the March 23rd uh, business meeting. Okay. We have four minutes, uh, less than four minutes remaining. Uh, any. Uh, um, I guess Tom arrived around here because anything we want to bring up to discuss at future meetings. If not, we'll go ahead and turn the meeting.